Well, good morning. My name is Richie Ford, and I minister to the children and the families here at Hope. Well, Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, that from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. One of the greatest responsibilities any of us can bear is when the Lord entrusts children to our care. Because we recognize the great blessing and responsibility of children uh, here at Hope, we offer parents the opportunity to participate in a parent-child dedication. Parent-child dedication is a declaration of a parent's intent to raise their child to know and love Jesus. It is also an opportunity for parents to submit to the authority of Jesus, dedicating back to God that which he has given them. Parent-child dedication is an act of accountability between the family and the church to work together so that their child will be inspired to become fully alive in Jesus Christ. Today we have two families that have taken that step of formally dedicating themselves uh, and their children to the Lord. This morning, they will publicly declare that promise to you. Nick and Rachel Blazer are bringing Emerson Peter and Elise Ivy Blazer. Nice. And my wife is here this morning. I always say these pictures always get me a little bit in trouble because we don't have enough shots like that. So thanks a lot. Max and Unique Baca are bringing Julian and Sophie Layla Baca. guys two for two on one-upping the pictures that we have so parents I call your attention to the commands of God recorded in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 7 hear O Israel the Lord our God is one love the Lord God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts impress them on your children Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And in first service, I even said when you're taking your kids to sporting events, when you're sitting down at dinner, when you're in the car on the way to somewhere not that important, all the, the busyness of life. Parents, you are to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and teach your children to do the same. As you and your daily lives love God and one another, you will model before your children a wonderful life of dedication to and love for God that they will want for themselves. Friends and family that commit uh, to investing in the lives of our children to help follow the example of our Lord fulfill a role as well. For encouragement and fulfilling the covenant these parents are making today, the Blazers call upon Krista and Rick Shanehoffen, Carrie Blazer, and Rosalind Greyert. Through the years, you all will be instrumental in providing this family with encouragement and accountability regarding the covenant that is being made today. Dads, as a representation of your spiritual leadership in the home, uh, if you would, please hold your children during this portion of the dedication. Parents, you have already made a promise to follow the Christian Parents Covenant here at Hope. You will now confirm these promises in front of the congregation, uh, declaring your intentions for your family. Please respond to the following statements with we do. Parents, do you promise to dedicate yourselves to God, to pursue him first, and to living in a way that your children will witness in you a lifestyle of following Jesus? As a part of the body of Christ here at Hope, do you promise uh, your involvement in the many, many ministry opportunities, both to be served and to serve? In order to honor God and live his best for your life, do you promise to honor your marriage vows, which will also provide a strong foundation of family for your children? Do you promise to discipline your child in love in order for them to develop the discernment to make wise choices that honor God? And do you promise to pray for and guide your children with the end goal of accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Church family, would you join with me and extend a hand as we pray a prayer of blessing on these families? 
Father, we just want to thank you uh, for this space. We want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the heart of these families, for the Blazers, for the Bacas, uh, for standing up here in, in a short five-minute ceremony. We know it's so much more than that. Uh, what they're doing is showing what's going on in their heart, uh, and we're thankful for that. They desire uh, to put you first, Jesus. So I just pray that you continue to put that on these families' hearts. We lift Emerson Peter and Elise Ivy, Julian and Sophie Layla. We lift them to you, Father. We pray that you walk ahead of their days, uh, that your hand of blessing would be upon them, and that that blessing would come in the form of a heart that is soft and receptive to your word, uh, and that these families would be empowered uh, to show them your love. Go with them now, Father. We pray your blessing upon them in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's take a moment and congratulate these families. And let's continue as a church family to lift them up in prayer as well. Before you guys go, uh, we do have some gifts for you and your children from your church family, as well as a certificate of today's commitment. At this time, kids, grades K through 5, you are dismissed for Kids Quest right out here to the doors uh, to my right. Parents, if you are new today, uh, please feel free to walk with your child to see where they're going uh, and where you will pick them up as well. Also, if you have little ones with you uh, and they're anything uh, like my four uh, energetic and wonderful children, uh, there's a chance they might become restless and maybe a little bit distracting to those of, around you. So if that's the case, we'd love for you uh, to take advantage of either our nursery or our parents' and moms' rooms where you can view the service and the TVs in there. Thanks. Stop me on the corner. I love that dog, man, on the, on the slide. Brighter than the sun. Well, hey, we're looking forward to summer here. I hope you are too. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. I just want to kind of have a conversation with you around what your summertime will look like and making your summer matter this morning. So if you have blue notes, we want to encourage you to pull those out. Want to take notes today or you can go on the U version, Y O U version Bible app on your smartphone, click on events, find the events tab and Hope Community Church will come on up and you can follow all along with what we're going to be talking about today. Here's what I know uh, as it relates to summertime in Shano County. And I've said it before, I will say it again, in Shano, recreation is king. It is what rules us, right? Because we only got a few short weeks to make it all happen. And I love it. You know, you can go to a big city, whether it's Chicago or Milwaukee or, uh, you know, even the Twin Cities, and a big blockbuster movie will come out in the middle of July or something like that. And the movie theaters are absolutely packed, but not here in Shano. If it's a beautiful day, there's hardly anybody there, right? If it's raining, then you're going to see some in the theater. But in Shano, it's all about enjoying the great outdoors. And you know, I've said this before too, but you know, June 21st, the days in about a month are going to start getting shorter. I literally, right around that time, start having nightmares that summertime is over. So I like to say, hey, what can I do to make my summer count? And so mom and dad, here's what I also know uh, about summertime for you is many of you just... You're trying to get it all in, but you know, week after week, you are just flat out stressed out. 
you're working hard, maybe some extra hours to pay for some event. You know, you're trying to find the right way to provide daycare for your kids. You know, you're trying to keep all the extended relatives and friends happy because you got a hundred birthdays, graduations, and weddings to go to because everybody wants it in that nine-week period of time. And then you go off for the big glamping event or camping event with the extended family. And you get there, you haul it all there. Three days later, you haul it all back and you just have to hang it up to dry. Because why? It rained two and a half days out of the three while you were there. And then you have a 12-hour turnaround because you've got to get your daughter ready to go to camp on Monday morning. I know this. It happens. But yet, we love summer. Can't wait for it to begin. Bring it on, right? That's what we believe. So before this madness begins, let's just have a talk. You know, we just got done finishing talking about Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, you know, he, he's saying everything is meaningless. I don't want us to get to the end of the summer saying that. That everything was just meaningless in our lives. In other words, what's going to count? How can you make it count this summer? Let's ask the question, how do I make my summer really matter? Because no matter what happens in your summer, whether it goes good or bad, whether it's a warm summer or a cold summer or it rains or you get that summer cold. How many of you ever got the sick in the summer, summer cold? No? I was in North Carolina a few years ago, and I swear I got the flu. You know, a few days in, I got the chills, I got the cough, I'm driving sweaty on the way home. It's not a good time. But no matter what the circumstances may dictate, good times, fun times, bad times, the question we want to ask is how do I make my summer really matter. I got three steps. First one is this. I need to explore the right paths. The right paths. So if you like hiking, if you like going out uh, camping, there's always some new path to explore. I'm not just talking new paths. I'm talking about the right paths. Because, right, some of the new paths we choose can go bad. Some of the new paths we choose can go from bad to worse. Have you ever been, you know, like driving through a big city and, you know, one of your kids has to go to the bathroom or you got to take this exit and you get off on the wrong exit and all of a sudden you look around and you go, oh, I'm in trouble. Have you ever happened to that? Just so you know, people that drive through Shano and get off here and they're from the big city, they stop in Shano and they're saying the same thing. Oh, I'm in trouble. When we take new steps, some of those new steps aren't always good steps. They're not always the right path. So I want to talk about what does it mean for me to explore the right path? Because the wrong path, if you take the wrong path, it could really not just make a mess of your summer. It could make the mess of your life. Right? You could go in that wrong direction. This week I was uh, talking with Cassie, you know, who works here, and she was talking about making time, choosing a new path that was a right path for her. They all went on vacation, and it was just a, a vacation where there weren't a lot of doing happening. There were just a lot of being together, spending time together as a family, and it was the right path. Because sometimes, what do we do in our vacations? We think it's going to be a new vacation, but we book it so solidly that we never have time to talk to anyone or do anything of real importance. All we're doing is we're exchanging a busy work schedule for an extremely busy play schedule, and we're exhausted. Now, I have nothing wrong with, you know, having great vacations. I got nothing wrong with, you know, spending time. If you're going to Disney World, God bless you this summer. I got, I got no problem with that. But just because it's a new path doesn't make it a right path. So how do we know what the right path is? Look at this with me, Psalm 27. Here's what I know. I'm not very good at that. I need God's help. Teach me, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Start this summer saying, God, I need you to lead me, not just on a new path, not just on a fun path. I need you to lead me on the right path. Because here's what I know. The enemy wants to take out you and your family. Do you know that? He wants to get in the mix. He wants to stir things up. He wants your kids to wander away from him. He wants your marriage to go into a hole. He does not want that. Now, how is the enemy going to do that? Is he going to tempt you to shoplift? Is he going to tempt you to rob a bank or steal a car? Is he going to tempt you to hook up with a prostitute? Most likely not. But how he'll do it is he'll keep you extremely busy. So busy you won't have any time to do the right thing. And, it, and he might even keep you so busy doing all the good things 
But the question is, are you asking God, God, lead me along the right path this summer? Because God's path is what's going to breathe life into you. God's path is going to give you rest. Look at these, Psalm 16. You have made known to me the path of life. If we're asking God, God, lead me along the right path, his path will bring you life. There will be fullness of joy. There will be pleasures, eternal pleasures forevermore when you're doing the right thing. So many times I, I think we, we question God, don't we? And we feel like, okay, if I'm going to really follow God, you know, my life's going to be boring. I just think about when Jesus said, come follow me. So we got these young guys, they're probably in their late teens, at best, early 20s. And Jesus said, leave your nets and follow me. Look at the story, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. So Jesus called them, come follow me. They left what they thought was a good path. They got on the right path and what happened? What happened? They were willing to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to lead me on the right path. And as they said, yes. They literally changed the world forever. Do you realize that you and I are sitting here today because these guys left their nets and said yes to Jesus? That, seriously, that is why 2,000 years later we are sitting here today. Now you might be saying, okay, Pastor John, I get it. I, yes, of course, of course, of course, I, I, I want to follow Jesus, but, but how do I do that? You might say, yes, of course, Pastor John, I want to be on the right path, but I got, I got problems deciding what's the right path. Have you ever had that? You know, your life's so busy, what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do? And I'm not talking morally right or wrong, I'm talking, it could be a, a number of good things that I get to choose from. How do I know which one is right? I just want you to hear Jesus' words on this. Jesus said this, I am the gate and those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely, and they will find good pastures. In other words, Jesus is the gatekeeper of the right path. Did you see that? He says the thief's purpose, so it's the wrong path, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich, satisfying life. But Jesus says, I'm the gatekeeper. So what does that tell me? What should that tell you? If I want to be on the right path, hmm, I better ask Jesus what that is. If I want to be on the right path, hmm, I better seek him on it. I better want to get to know Jesus so that I can know his path. They might say, well, how, how do I know what Jesus is telling me, okay? Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says in John 10, the gatekeeper opens the gate for them. The sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and they lead him out. So in other words, for me to get on the right path, I have to have Jesus to lead me on the right path. And for Jesus to, me, to lead me on the right path, what do I have to do? I have to hear his voice. I have to know what he's saying to me. So what does that tell me? I just have to know Jesus. So any time you spend this summer getting to know Jesus, guess what? That's the right path. Anything you can implement in your vacations or whatever you're doing in life to get to know Jesus, that's the right path. Why does Jesus use this illustration about shepherds and sheep and gates and paths? Because he knows what sheep are, right? How many of you have ever raised sheep? Okay, a few of you maybe. Not the brightest animal in the world. Not very smart at all. Because they'll see some green grass, you know, a foot away, and they'll just go over there, munch, 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 right? Oh, look at that, another green clump of grass. Munch, 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 munch. And they'll keep wandering foot after foot after foot until, you know what, they're off the path. They've wandered away. And pretty soon the green grass that they're munching on is right next to some quicksand. Pretty soon the green grass they're munching on is right next to a cliff. Pretty soon the green grass, ooh, this is great green grass, and it's right in front of a wolf's den oblivious to what's going around. What looks to be good and green is off the path. Jesus says, I am the gatekeeper. I will put you on the good path that will lead to what? Good pastures. So many times we think we know what's good for us. And it's not good for us. We're just munching on some green grass right next to a cliff. And it's not the right path. Jesus longs to that for us. So are we this summer choosing the right path? And the only way you can know for certain 
And it can be a lot of good things. You know, we know the bad things, right? You know that. Ah, I'm off the rhyme. I'm off the path. The only way you can know that it's the right path for you, for your family, for your busy schedule, is are you connecting with Jesus on it? Have you ever thought of that? Jesus, I need you to bring me life. You promised me life. So we ought to live with the expectation that when we start out our summer, when we start out our day, Jesus, lead me along that right path. Leads me to number two, right? Because if you're on the right path, you need to be around this summertime the right people. Wouldn't you agree? I love the truth of this verse, and I think every single one of us can identify, can't we? Walk with wise, and what will you become? wise. Associate with fools and you will get into trouble. Somebody say that's happened to them, yes and amen, right? Yes. You get, you get through life, right? I think every time, think about a time right now that you got into trouble. I mean, serious trouble, all right? And I would bet anything that that time you got into serious trouble was because you were hanging out with the wrong people. I mean, maybe you were the wrong people. I don't know. But chances are, I almost guarantee it. So walk with those who are wise and become wise. You know, and this is not just, this is true for teenagers. A lot of times we say, you know, make sure you hang out with the right people. Adults, make sure you hang out with the right people. You hang out with the wrong people this morning, I mean this this summer, how are you going to be influenced? And I'm not saying you can't Okay, I'm not saying, oh, you just need to hang out with your church people this summer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm asking you a simple question. When you hang out with somebody, and let's say they're not Christians, maybe say they're not believers, who's having the influence? Are they influencing you, or are you influencing them? It's that simple. We're to have friends out in the community. We should, we, we should be hanging out with unbelievers, but are we being an influence on them, or are they influencing us? And if we can't answer that question clearly, I'm not telling you to dump all those friendships, but I'm saying you need to limit the amount of time you have with those friendships so you can hang out with the right people. Why is that so important? Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. They were saying this back then, just like they say today. Let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. In other words, let's party it up and let's just have fun. There's no consequences to that. Paul writes that, don't be fooled by people who say such things. Bad company corrupts good character. You You can be a really good person. You can be doing all the right stuff. And you can just decide to hang out with the wrong people. And it's going to corrupt your character. Think carefully, Paul says, about what is right and just stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't even know God at all. Meaning you have taken down, you've been taken down a road influenced by all these other people that there's no mark on you at all as even having known Jesus. And that can happen. That can happen in one summer. We need to understand as followers of Jesus, who is influencing me and who am I influencing others, and how am I influencing others. And and by the way, this is not just about you this summer. Do you know that? It's not just about, okay, who who can I hang out with that's going to, you know, make a difference in my life. It's also, that's part of it, but it's also about who will you make a difference in this summer. Are you one of those right people that can help somebody else out? Are you, one of, are you being, this summer, one of those right people who are going to make a difference in somebody else's life? And honestly, summertime is the perfect time to do that. You know why? Because, okay, when I say guys, you know, you need to make a difference in a guy's life, and you need to pour yourself into them, and you need to, you know, disciple them, or whatever word you want to use. Okay, for us guys, what do we know? That's not just, you know, sitting across the table sipping on some coffee, right? Go to a ball game. Because what do guys like to do when they go to a ball game? They watch a game and they talk. And they talk about life. And they can talk about their family. And they can talk about their wife and their kids and what's going on in their career. Summertime is the perfect time to invest in somebody else's life. So why not buy two tickets, take someone to the ball game? And women, okay? You like sitting down and having coffee. Well, have coffee. Have people over on your patio. Spend some time. Pour your life into some other woman's life. 
Now, you might be thinking, okay, if you're older, oh, I'm not young anymore, you know, I don't know anybody. Listen, our church right now, with the young couples that you saw up here on stage in the first service, there's four other young couples, and they're having kids. If you say, I'm an older, mature saint, you like that? You like that definition? All right. If I'm an older and mature saint, we need you to invest in these younger families' lives. We need you to do that. We need you to be the right people for them. Because there's plenty of wrong people. All you got to do if you want to be a right people in somebody's life, give our office a call and say, Pastor John said, I, I can be a right people. <laughs> and you can do that. We need that. Summertime is perfect. Here's what Paul writes in 1 uh, Thessalonians. So encourage each other and build each other up. If I were to ask the question this morning, I don't need you to raise your hands. If I were to ask the question, how many of you have somebody who is building you up, I bet you it would be less than half. Less than half. It might even be less than, a, than 25% of you would say, I have somebody in my life that's building me up. How many of you in your life are building anybody else up where you're investing into somebody else's life? This is what we're called to do. We all need it. We all would say yes. How would you like to get at the end of the summer and saying, yeah, I met with this person, and they just, they just really encouraged me? Or for you to have met with somebody, and you really helped set the new direction and a new path for somebody else's life. Because you were those right people. We need to be about that, church. The more I realize this, the older I get, is I need, I need somebody who's building me up, not tearing me down. And, and, and young people, if you can grab a hold of this now, when you're young, to choose friends who build you up and not tear you down. Listen, all the cool kids at school, most of the time those cool kids do nothing but tear people down. That's why they're cool. Get new friends. Choose people who are going to build you up, who are going to encourage you. Learn that now. Find people in, in your life now to do that. You be that person for somebody else. All of us need builders in our life, and we need to be building others. So this summer, my encouragement to you, make time for the right people. Okay, here we go. Number three, if you really want summer to matter, I need to let principles guide my priorities. Principles guide my priorities. And I may say to me, here's what I can predict in your life. I can tell you your priorities in life. If you just show me a few things in your life, I can tell you what you make a priority, all right? It's where you spend your money, what you do with your time, and where you put your energy. You might say, I don't know what my priorities are. Okay, okay, let's think about it. Where am I spending my money? Where am I putting all my time? Where am I putting all my energy? That is your priority in life. And I think, not just for the summer, but especially during the summer, we have to have some values, Right? We have to have some principles that guide those priorities. Because if you're like me, your priorities get skewed. They get a little whacked. So what do we need to do? Jesus puts us on the right path, right? How do we get on the right path? We hear Jesus' voice. Let's listen to Jesus' voice. Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else. And his righteousness. And he will give you everything you need. There it is. Jesus is principle ought to set our priorities. Am I seeking God above all else and his kingdom and his righteousness? And you know what the byproduct of that is? God will give you then everything you need, everything your heart needs. Notice I didn't say greeds. <laughs> everything your heart needs. Sometimes, here's what I think. I think we need something, right? And we don't need it. It's just a want. It's just a greed. But here's what we do. Here's what we do with God. We say, okay, God, uh, I, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. Yeah, that's a good thing. Check. Um, God, you know, I might even give a little bit in the offering. Okay, check. Oh, pastor said I need to be reading my Bible and praying. Okay, I need to be doing that. Great. Oh, life group, great. Okay, God, I did these seven things, whatever those seven things you think are. So, God, you have to bless me with whatever I want. Right? That's how we think of that. Now let me ask you, parents, for those of you who are parents, what if you did that to your kids? Okay, if you clean up your room, if you kind of, you know, be nice to me, show some respect around the house, get your homework done, you know, behave well at school, I will give you anything you want. How do you think your kids would turn out? 
They'd be a bunch of spoiled brats. All right? If you gave them everything they ever wanted, no, what have you done? A good parent gives them everything they ever needed. And there's a big difference. Because if you get everything you want, you'll end up destroying yourself. You'll end up making a mess of your life. So God, out of his love and his care and his passion for us, as we seek him first, gives us everything that we need. Gives us, breathes life into us as we do that. So what does Jesus want for us to do as we set our priorities? And he makes it real simple, very simple. Two things, we talked about it last week, what's going to bring meaning to, into our lives. What are those two things? What do we say? Loving God, right? Brings meaning and loving others. How do we know that? Jesus said this. Greatest commandment. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the demands of the law, all the principles, you could say, of having a good life are found in those two commandments. Loving God and loving other people. Those two things should guide and set our priorities. Now, I I get it. You can look at me and say, okay, Pastor John, that's pretty simple. I got to love God. All right. I got to love others. Great. Thanks for coming. You know, have a great week. Here's what I know around that stuff. I get confused. I don't know quite how to process that. So I've come up with just three questions to ask you. Three questions that I think will help you look at your summer and set some priorities. (coughs) Excuse me. So how are you going to love God and love others? Three questions you need to ask. First question, what will I purchase this summer? Now, you might be arguing with me and say, oh, Pastor John, purchasing stuff, that doesn't, you don't have to purchase love for God. No, but what you purchase will demonstrate to me whether or not you love God. Won't it? You want to go to a strip club, tip all the girls? Is that loving God? You'd say absolutely not. (laughs) <laughs> that's not loving God, and that's certainly not loving other people. So I, I, that's just an extreme, extreme example to say spending money very often describes how well we love God. And once again, remember you want to be on the right path? You want to hear Jesus' voice? Here's what Jesus says. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Ah, hmm, ouch. Jesus, now you're meddling with me. I don't like that. I'm serious. Do we ever set aside some of our resources to make a difference? Maybe there's a family you know that's in need. Maybe God has put on your heart that you need to be supporting a ministry. What are we investing in? What are we purchasing that will make a difference for eternity? Now, I'm not against going on vacations. I'm not against having fun. But if we prioritize all of that stuff above his kingdom... What are we demonstrating? We're demonstrating where our love is, aren't we? If you want your summer to really matter, you've got to ask yourself, where's all my money going? So then what do you you have to do? Okay, just get along with Jesus, get to know him, spend time with him, say, Jesus, all right? What's the right path today? What are you asking me to do? Secondly, real life question here, what places will I go? This is simply saying, are you going to find yourself in places that are helpful to you, or will you find yourself in places that are harmful to you? Right? It's just just what we said. It's about choosing the right path. Here's what Paul says. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and godly living, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Some of you this summer need to start learning how to run. Exercise too, but that's the other thing. Some of you need to start learning how to run from wrong places. You need to realize, okay, ah, I know what's going to happen. If I get into this situation, ah, I'm just going to get caught back into that addiction I had before. Ah, if, I, if I get put into this situation, oh, it could be this bad party, and then mm, what's going to happen? You could end up flirting with a married person. I'm just being honest here. Wrong place. Why even set yourself up for that? You know what the places are that bring you the most temptation. Jesus says, learn how to run. So what places are you going to go this morning, this summertime? Places of unhealthy relationships or places of relationships and people that are going to help you grow? Here's how I think of it. 
I think about it is as running to or putting yourself in the right path, and I would call that path the path of grace. You heard us talk about grace here at Hope? Grace is simply saying none of us deserve the goodness of God. And it's all because of Jesus' grace, right? That he saves us, forgives us, loves us. That is a free gift. You don't do anything to earn that. But here's what I know about myself. I tend to forget all of that. I tend to forget all the good things of God. So what I need to do, I need to put myself, place myself, run to the place where I get to experience and remember more of God's grace. And you need to be intentional in doing that. Because if you don't be intent, if you're not intentional in doing that you're going to get through the entire summer and you're going to wonder what happened I just spent the whole summer in the wrong place for example my encouragement to you and I think it's one of the best things you could do when you're on vacation don't forget to worship God why because then you don't have to hear me every Sunday I'm serious. You get to hear somebody else. You get to hear new music. You need to meet some new brothers and sisters in the family of God somewhere else. My encouragement to you is so much so not out of religious duty, not because you think God's going to love you more or less because you go to church. That's flat out not true. But rather, I don't want to forget. So I'm going to put myself in the path of grace. Another example. You're on vacation, you're staying in a nice place, maybe it's an overnight at a hotel. Instead of getting in up in the morning and just flipping on Sports Center or flipping on Fixer Upper reruns or whatever it is that you like, all right, maybe grab a cup of coffee, find a deck or a porch or somewhere quiet, and just say, okay, Jesus, I just want to talk to you. I want to say, what is right today for me? And it doesn't mean you've got to plow through five chapters of the Bible, but maybe take just a short little section of some Jesus' words. Why not read a psalm, something that's going to put you back in that path of grace. His grace is always there. Sometimes we just need to step back into it because we forget. Or, or, or why not when you feel discouraged or you feel upset or something's not going right in your life, why not giving a phone call to that friend? Why not saying, hey, can you meet me for coffee? Can we go to a ball game together? Can we do something? Because I need to connect because I'm feeling off the path right now and I need to get back on the path. Will you help me? That's what I'm talking about. Putting yourself back on the path of grace. Third question you need to ask yourself. What pace this summer am I going to practice? What's going to be my pace of life? We all look to the summer to get recharged and refreshed, but sometimes that flat out most of the time just does not happen because we're panicked to get it all in, and our pace actually picks up over the summer instead of slowing down. We're looking for rest. We're trying to find rest in that vacation. We're trying to find rest in this comfort food. We're trying to find rest uh, doing something different and new. And all that stuff is great, but there's only one place we can find rest. Once again, let's hear the voice of the shepherd. Let's get on the right path because Jesus said, come to me if you're weary and you carry heavy burdens. And what happens? And I will just give you rest. I'll just give it to you. But you've got to come to him you got to hear his voice. you got to want to experience him somehow, some way. So nothing wrong with getting up early morning and, and going fishing, but somehow why, why, why not figure out some way, some place where you can say, Jesus, I want to I hear your voice because ah, okay, I don't have to catch the big one right now. I don't have to drive, 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 drive all day. Maybe I'll shut the engine off, sit, and I'll, and I'll look out a little bit, and I'll say, Jesus, I want to spend some time with you because I need that rest. I don't know what that looks like for you. The good thing about a summer is it can be new places. It can be a new walk somewhere down a path. It can be while you're camping and you're trying to escape from the kids, whatever it is, to find that space for rest. Because why? What happens when we do that? Our souls get fed. Because we can be somewhere with Jesus where we get to experience more of his love, more of his care, more of his his forgiveness. Our identity begins to be shaped by his. We begin to understand we're a child of God in the midst of all the busyness 
vacation time and summertime is the perfect time. I didn't see any of you sitting out during the blizzard going, oh yes, Jesus, I'm meeting with you right now. There's a few crazies out there who would do that. but It's my encouragement to you, set the pace. So schedule it. You're going to have to be intentional with it. You're going to have to remember it. Because I don't know about you. Here's what happens to me when I get on vacation. I can go the whole week and I can know I barely cracked it or I didn't open it at all. I didn't even look in my Bible. I can get through a week of vacation because I'm out of the routine of what I do for ministry and realize I haven't prayed for anyone. The only question I answered was when the lady said to me, do you want that supersized or not, you know? We need to create space in our summer to be with Jesus, and that's going to mean changing your pace. Figure it out. Wrestle with him on it. Talk to him about it, because here's what I know. If you simply go to Jesus and say, Jesus, somehow I want to make you a priority. I want to make you a centerpiece of my summer this morning because I want my summer to matter. Here's what I know. If you were to pray that prayer, I guarantee you Jesus will answer that. I just guarantee it. He's going to speak real clearly. He's going to make his presence known in your life. So imagine hope. Imagine if we would all come back on Labor Day, fully energized. Oh, we... It was a great summer. Of course, we did all of our fun stuff. We saw all kinds of people. We hung out. We, we ate food. We, we, we got together. We sang. We danced. Whatever it is you like to do. But one of added to that as a priority was in all those things I met with Jesus on all of it. Imagine how rested we would be. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you that you care about us and you care about our summertime. You care about when we want to rest and vacation. You create this beautiful area, this beautiful place for us to enjoy summertime. God, we are eternally grateful for that. I just would pray that you would help us remember you. Jesus, we want our summer to matter. Help us make it matter as we focus on what you would have us do. Keep us on that right path. We ask for your grace in that. We can't do that by ourselves work on our hearts. Purify us toward that end, we pray. Amen. We want to invite the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering, and uh, as they do, just...